um, this, thank you very much, Fedor. I, actually, uh, Fedor did not mention that he wrote the index for one of the books based on the podcast, or at least one of them, maybe more than one of them. Um, and we know each other for a long time, so it's uh, great to be here at his invitation. This indeed is um, going to be a presentation of some of the work I did uh, in this ERC project, especially together with one of the post then postdocs who's now at Fordham University named Bly Soma. Um, and it's about a philosopher theologian named Fakhreddin Arazi, who lived in the 12th, in just barely into the 13th century, and what he thought about animals. The kind of payoff of the talk is that he thought that animals can be rational or intelligent, depending on how you want to translate the key term, which is a very surprising thing for someone to have thought in the 12th century, right? I mean, just think about the fact that in the Aristotelian tradition, it's very common to just define human as rational animal, right? Implying that all the other animals are non-rational. That's maybe some uh, kind of just uh, a definition they just kind of throw around without thinking about it very much, but it is also something that they seem to be committed to. So in this talk, I'm going to present that idea, the sort of orthodox view that only humans are rational, why they might have thought this. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about a philosopher who's the immediate context for understanding Fakhreddin's position, who's the most important philosopher of the Islamic tradition, namely Ibn Sina, maybe more famous under the name of Avicenna. And the reason I need to talk about him is that it's really to him that Fakhreddin is responding when he makes this argument that animals can also be rational. But first, let's start with the conventional or orthodox view. And of course, we have to start with Aristotle, as so often. Aristotle has a lot to say about animals. In fact, one of the kind of mysterious things about ancient philosophy is that Aristotle writes this vast corpus of works on zoology. So we've got the parts of animals on the generation of animals, on the motion of animals, history of animals. And unlike other works of his on logic, on physics, on the soul, on metaphysics, on ethics, these works don't receive any commentaries in late antiquity. In fact, there's no Greek commentary on any of his zoological works until the Byzantine period when a group of commentators who are uh, gathered around a queen or at least princess named Anna Komnene, decide to write commentaries on all the texts by Aristotle that haven't already been commented on in antiquity. So this is a kind of underappreciated feature of Aristotle's corpus in antiquity. Um, in the medieval period, it gets some attention in Latin, especially from Albert the Great, the, the teacher of Aquinas. So he writes about zoology. He also writes about botany. He was a very um, intrepid natural philosopher. Did things like rappelling down cliffs to look at nests of birds. Very cool. Uh, he, they don't call him Albert the Great for nothing. Um, but uh, it's also true that the zoological works are quite valued in the Arabic tradition. So they were translated into Arabic. They were translated as a single work just called al Hayawan, so animals, as just one big text. And they were known to people like Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, and so on. Ibn Sina actually writes a work of his own on animals that's kind of based on it. So Aristotle's absolutely a fundamental source of information about animals. Um, and the, the information is often quite detailed. So the anatomy of animals, the way that their embryos look, um, the way that they move, like the difference between flying animals, four-footed animals, two-footed animals, what do they eat, where do they live, and so on. History of animals also has uh, some information in it, which is a little bit fanciful, like, you know, animals healing themselves by deliberately eating certain herbs or things like that. But by and large, Aristotle's observations of animals are very impressive. He himself did dissections of animals, often of marine life, and he described many, many animals and animal structures for the first time. So the dude is really into animals. Okay, that's what I'm trying to communicate to you here. Um, and in fact, I would say it's, it's really amongst his most, uh, it's most it's among his most amazing achievements. 
is his empirical work on the animal world. Yet, in some sense, he rates animals kind of low in another respect, namely that he doesn't really ascribe to animals very high cognitive powers. In particular, he draws a really um, kind of rigorous divide between humans, on the one hand, who have the capacity for reasoning and what he calls nous, which means intellect. So we've got humans on the one hand, and we've got animals on the other hand, who only have animal souls and are capable of sensation and motion. So in other words, they can move around. That differentiates them from plants, because plants can only engage in the powers of the vegetative soul, in other words, the plant soul. So that's kind of tautologist. But what that would mean is um, the ability to reproduce and the ability to engage in nutrition. So plants can take in food and water. They can make more plants. They can reproduce. Animals can do, do those things. They can also perceive. They can also move around. But only humans can think rationally. That's something that we share in common with God, which is not an insignificant fact. Right? So there's something divine about humans. At the end of the ethics, Aristotle says that the life of philosophy is almost more than human because it allows us to partake in divinity. So even for all that he has a lot to say about animals and for all that he was extremely interested in them, he still draws this very hard and fast divide between non-human animals on the one hand and humans on the other hand. Something else that we're going to see is going to be important is that he says that the mind, the human mind, does not have a bodily organ through which it is exercised. So he does not think that you're thinking with your heart. So, well, he doesn't think you're thinking with your brain because he doesn't think the brain does very much. He thinks it's a kind of cooling element in your body. But also he doesn't think you're thinking with your heart, even though your sensation and some of your other cognitive powers are seated in the heart, like probably your imagination is seated in the heart, but not your mind. So your intellect, nous, is exercised without any bodily organ. And later philosophers, and we're going to see this in Ibn Sina, later philosophers thought that this is a sign that Aristotle would believe that you can survive the death of your body. Because if you don't need a bodily organ to think, then why, would you, why wouldn't you be able to keep thinking after you die? Right? Um, why now, here's a, here's a question that people, I think, don't ask themselves enough. Why in the world would Aristotle have thought this? Why would he think that animals can't think or can't engage in reason or intellection? After all, animals do all kinds of problem solving. They build thing, amazing things like webs and nests. We're going to see later on that this is important for Fakhreddin. They, uh, they even apparently can do geometry. Think about beehives, right? perfect hexagons that tessellate. I wouldn't be able to build something like that. Right? So animals do all kinds of amazing things. And if there's anyone in the entire ancient world who is extremely aware of the amazing things that animals do, it's Aristotle. right? As I just said, dude is super into animals. So why does he think that animals fall be not just below humans in this respect, but why does he see this very striking difference between animals and humans? Well, there's maybe two reasons. One is that animals are not capable of language. So he may have a very strong connection in his mind between rational thinking and language, especially think about, if you think about the Greek words involved here. So the word for language is logos, and that's also the word for reason. Or the word rational is logike, right? So there's a very strong drive, even through the Greek language itself, to associate reasoning with language. That's one thing. Another thing is that he may have quite a narrow understanding of what intellect or reasoning actually involves. If you think that what it means to engage in intellect or reasoning is something like to engage in abstract thinking about general features of the universe, and that does seem to be what he thinks. There's a long story, what he thinks intellect is, so we don't have time to get into. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. But if it's something like that, abstract thinking about general features of the universe, 
then it's actually quite plausible to say that animals don't do that, right? Basically, animals don't do philosophy. So that's why we should say they don't engage in reasoning. Of course, most humans don't engage in philosophy either, right? So there's us, right? So the people in this room are better than animals. <laughs> Whether everyone else outside the room is, I mean, is a university, but you know, there's, there may be this kind of elitist attitude that like all of the non-scientists, non-philosophers are kind of like cows. And this is something you see again and again, actually, in the, in the later history of um, philosophy. For example, Ibn Rushd, or Averroes, the great medieval Muslim commentator on Aristotle, says at one point that most humans are human in name only because they don't do philosophy. Uh, this, and this actually is not an unimportant, I mean, it's kind of funny, but it's also got a very dark side, right? So when they discovered the Americas, they were like, well, these people don't do philosophy, so we can basically treat them as if they were herd animals. So this is not unimportant, um, this feature of Aristotelianism. Okay, so that's Aristotle's position. We don't need to put the blame for all of that on Aristotle, but that's, he, he sort of kicks off this way of thinking about humans and animals. And for the most part, other ancient philosophers agree. So in particular, the Stoics agree, and the Platonists maybe agree sometimes. So there are exceptions, and they come mostly in the Platonic tradition. In particular, there's a second century philosopher who is a Platonist named Plutarch, and a uh, third, fourth century philosopher named Porphyry, who is the student of Plotinus, the founder of Neoplatonism, if that means anything to you. Um, Porphyry wrote a work using some material from Plutarch in which he argues explicitly that animals can use language, and he gives a whole bunch of reasons to think that they can use language. As he says, we don't understand them, but we don't understand people from Scythia either, but we don't say that they're not rational. So when the, the animals seem to be communicating with each other, so probably they're just speaking a language we can't understand. He also gives examples of um, animals that can respond to linguistic commands. He says he had a pet bird who could do this. And what he says is, atta so attacking this link between reasoning and language in the Stoics rather than Aristotle, he says that the Stoics are wrong to deny intelligence to animals on the basis that they can't talk because, in fact, they probably can talk. At least some of them can talk. But Plutarch and Porphyry, uh, as interesting as they are, aren't really relevant for us today because their works were not translated into Arabic, or at least these works by them were not translated into Arabic. So they kind of fall out of the story. And what's communicated to the Arabic tradition is basically a unified view according to which animals are non-rational, and that completely differentiates them from humans. Um, okay, now let's think a little bit more about what I was saying just a moment ago, namely that animal cognition falls below human cognition because it doesn't involve thinking abstractly about general features of the universe. So I, I want to flesh that out a little bit. Um, what this would mean in the terms that become familiar in the Arabic tradition but to some extent, this is all pretty well grounded in Aristotle himself, would be that animals can only grasp particulars. They can't grasp generalities. So uh, what this would mean is that, for example, a mother giraffe could see that another animal is a giraffe, maybe, they might, and they would certainly be able to recognize particular giraffes, like the mother can recognize her own offspring. That's not a problem. And of course, they can sort of differentiate between giraffes and non-giraffes. Like, if you put another giraffe in front of a giraffe, the giraffe will be like, giraffe, don't care. <laughs> Whereas if you put a lion in front of the giraffe, the giraffe will be like, oh, crap, and it will turn and run away with that loping stride that we're so familiar with, right? So they react appropriately. But to do that, they don't need to have the notion of like giraffes as opposed to lions, right? Like they don't need to think about the species of lion or the species of giraffe. They just have to be like, oh, there's a dangerous animal. I'm going to run. 
there's a safe animal, so I'm not going to run. Um, now, obviously, we also grasp particulars all the time, right? And in fact, um, as I was saying, a lot of humans may not think at the level of generalities very often, or even at all. So you can do things like enjoy a nice piece of cake without engaging in any general abstract reasoning about cake, right? So you don't have to think, ah, cake, here's a piece of cake that falls under the species of cake, which falls under the species of the genus of baked goods. And I've had other baked goods, and I enjoyed them. Therefore, I may enjoy right? You can do that if you want, but most of us are just like, ah, cake, right? And you just eat it. Uh, you also, at least I spend very little time thinking about whether and in respect, the members of my own family fall under the species of human. I don't know about your own family lives. But basically, for practical purposes, we don't need to think about think like this very much. We think like this when we're doing science. Um, now, the examples I've just given are really about sense perception, right? Like giraffes seeing other giraffes or lions, us seeing pieces of cake. But even when we're engaging in what you might think of as somewhat more abstract forms of cognition, we're still actually dealing with particulars most of the time. So for example, um, show of hands, who had cake yesterday? That's it? This is Great Britain. Come on. This is the best thing about the country. OK. So those of you who had cake, so those of you who raised your hand, or those of you who thought, I did have cake, but I'm not admitting that in front of all these people. You were remembering the cake you had yesterday, and you were remembering a particular piece of cake, namely the particular piece of cake you had yesterday, right? Some of you may have foregone a piece of cake yesterday because you're, unlike me, you're very, you know, abstemious and self-controlled. So that was a particular piece of cake that you remember not eating. Also, everyone in the room is now imagining a piece of cake, right? because how could you not? That's sort of what cake is. It's the kind of thing that you imagine when people talk about it. And you were also imagining a giraffe looking at, another, at a lion or a giraffe a moment ago. What you were imagining was a particular giraffe, not necessarily a particular one you've seen. But if you have a kind of image of the giraffe, it's a an image of a particular giraffe that you've kind of cobbled together from storybooks, safaris, nature documentaries, whatever it is that's given you your image of giraffes. So that actually means that you, you can get through a lot of your mental life just dealing with particulars, right? Sort of constructed imaginary particulars or actual particulars. When you remember, when you imagine, you're dealing with particulars. And this would help explain how it is that animals can do some of these amazing things that they do, right? So why are they capable of apparently complex behaviors, recognizing things, maybe building things, making, apparently making plans, something like apparent means and reasoning. They're doing it all with memory and imagination, according to the um, conventional view. And this has an important consequence. So as I said before, Aristotle is of the view that the intellect doesn't have a bodily organ, but the imagination and memory do have a bodily organ. He would have thought, as I said before, that it's the heart. But by the time we get to the Arabic tradition, they know that it's the brain. And the reason they know that it's the brain is because Galen, the great doctor in the second century, has done empirical studies that prove that all of your cognitive powers are seated in the brain. Um, in particular, he shows that the commands that um, move the limbs travel through the nerves down from the brain. In the time of Aristotle, they didn't even know the nervous system existed, actually. And that was first discovered in Alexandria a couple of hundred years before uh, Galen. And Galen does experiments actually on animals in which he proves that it's really the brain that's the most central organ. Um, at one point, he says that if you want to show people how important the brain is, a really good way to do this is to take a pig put it on a stage, expose the nerves coming down from the neck, and then snip the nerves that go to the vocal cords because the pig will be making this incredible racket and screaming in pain, and then suddenly it will be silent. It was a, obviously a very gruesome experiment, but a very impressive one. Um, 
by contrast, intellection doesn't involve a bodily organ. So the difference between us and animals, as I said before, really is like along this line between material powers and immaterial powers. Even the things that we might think of as sort of part of our mental life or consciousness. And by the way, this is a real difference between the way we tend to think about it in philosophy of mind nowadays and the way that ancient and medieval people thought in their philosophy of mind. So for us, all the mental stuff is kind of whatever involves consciousness. So for us, something like imagination or memory uh, would be just, just as much on the mind side of things as abstract thinking. Whereas in the Aristotelian tradition, there's a huge difference between something like imagination and intellection. The difference is precisely um, the difference between particulars being grasped with a power that's seated in a bodily organ and universals, abstract generalities, being grasped with an immaterial power, namely intellect. Okay, so this particular versus universal thing tracks material versus immaterial powers. And this is all the kind of background for Ibn Sina's view. So Ibn Sina, um, like I said, is the most important philosopher in the Islamic tradition. He died in 1037. And he actually proves, or tries to prove, that the intellect is realized immaterially, and that the rational soul is, does not have a bodily organ, on the grounds that the rational soul or mind or intellect, so the Arabic word um, here for, for intellect is akl, which can also be translated as a reason sometimes. That power, he thinks, can't be realized in a bodily organ, just as Aristotle said, but he gives a different argument that's not found in Aristotle. And his argument is precisely on the basis of universals versus particulars. So, and this is a little bit complicated and probably won't convince you, <laughs> but here's the argument anyway for what it's worth. So his, his idea is that if a universal were received in a particular, like in an, in an organ, then the universal would somehow be rendered particular. And his idea here is something like this. If you think about like the abstract idea of giraffe, that's just a kind of form or essence or something like that. And it becomes a particular giraffe because it's found in some matter, namely the matter that the giraffe is made of. Um, he compares this to the way a color could be received in a body or on a surface. So if, if a color appears in a surface, then it will be rendered a particular instance of that color, and there'll be some over here and some over here, right? So similarly, when giraffeness is received by matter, you get a particular giraffe of a certain size with a certain location. And it's really matter that generates the particularity in some sense, or that explains the particularity. Another way of thinking about this is in terms of um, individuation. So, the re so what makes this giraffe and this giraffe, I should have brought two giraffes with me as display objects, but the budget would not allow for it. I did ask Fedor, but apparently your university wouldn't support it. So, okay, you now you have to use your imagination, much vaunted imagination, which we share with animals. So imagine there's a giraffe here and a giraffe here. What do they have in common? What differentiates them? Well, in the first instance, what they have in common is that they're both giraffes, right? So it's not giraffehood that makes them different. What makes them different is things like there's one here and one there, spatial location. And there's a long story, which actually Fedor has worked on, <laughs> about what individu how individuation works in, in, uh, in the Sina. But to make a long story short, we can say that individuation is at least correlated with matter, right? So when you have one hunk of matter turned into a giraffe over here and another hunk of matter turned into a giraffe over here, you get two giraffes, whereas giraffehood is just one thing, so to speak. Um, so similarly, if we were to receive a universal idea in a bodily organ like the brain, then that would kind of constrain it or particularize it, 
it would no longer be universal. It would be rendered particular, just as giraffehood is rendered particular by being realized in one bit of matter rather than another bit of matter. That's his proof for the um, immateriality of the rational soul. Um, but he thinks that, just as we've seen in the other, uh, in the rest of the Aristotelian tradition, he, he holds on to this part of the traditional view. He thinks that our other cognitive powers are all realized in the brain. So the intellection is the only thing that we, re that we exercise without using a bodily organ. I mean, obviously things like digestion, reproduction, um, or eyesight or hearing, obviously these things are manifested um, and executed through bodily organs. It's less obvious that that's true with things like imagination and memory, but he thinks that those are just, those are just as much seated in the brain as, for example, your eyesight is seated in your eyes and your optic nerve and so on, your whole uh, visual system. Intellection is the, is the exception. Only intellection is exercised immaterially. And the more that you think about this and the more detailed your story about cognitive powers other than intellection becomes, the more you are accepting that there's quite a large degree of overlap between humans and animals. And actually, although we're going to get on to Fakhreddin Razi, who argues against Ibn Sina by saying that there's even more commonality between animals and humans than, than Ibn Sina thought. Actually, in my opinion, Ibn Sina is someone who should be recognized as really going very far in the direction of admitting that there's a lot of overlap or a lot of commonality between humans and animals. And this is precisely because he was so interested in the cognitive powers that we have that are shared with animals. So the, in other words, the cognitive powers that somehow fall short of intellection because they only deal with particulars. And this brings us to his celebrated theory of the internal senses. So we have five external senses, hearing, sight, smell, taste, touch, right, five. Similarly, this is very neat, we have five internal senses. Um, so we've got five external senses, hearing, sight, etc. We have five internal senses, the common sense, the retentive imagination, the estimation, which I'll say more about in a second, memory, and the compositive um, imagination. It actually doesn't matter very much how, how these all work and what their functions are. Um, but as we can see from this Latin medieval drawing, which is supposed to show Ibn Sina's theory, or what they would have called Avicenna's theory, they're all seated in the brain. So they're in different, um, what he calls ventricles of the brain. Like I think memories in the back, for example. So actually you can almost see them in my case because there's so little in the way. Um, and so he actually tells you where they are in your brain, like which lobes of the brain contain which powers. And again, what they all have in common is that, of course, they're internal, right? They're in, they're in the brain. They're not realized through something like eyes or ears or whatever. But also, they deal with particulars. And a really nice example of this is the so-called estimation, or wahm in Arabic. Um, estimation is a misleading translation here. The reason we often translate this word into English as estimation is that it was translated as estimatio into Latin. Um, but in English, it conjures up the idea of guessing or, or sort of approximating. And that's not what we're talking about at all. So I usually just say, I just usually use the word wahm for it because we, there is no easy, good translation into English. So this is a capacity that both humans and animals have, which allows them to register the properties that particular things have that aren't detectable by the external senses. And his example is the, I couldn't believe I found this picture, by the way, online, because it's so perfect. Um, I'm going to use this in every slideshow for the rest of my life as I talk about Avicenna's theory of Wahm. So his example is a sheep seeing a wolf and doing what these sheep are doing, which is running away from the wolf and hoping that they're not the slowest sheep, right? So why would a sheep do this? 
like ask yourself. Imagine you're in an Aristotelian universe, okay? So you've got so what a sheep can do is whatever Aristotle would say the sheep can do. So the sheep can smell the wolf. So the wolf smells, I don't know, however wolves smell. Musty, I'm thinking. Kind of musty. And it can see that the wolf has a gray coat, right? And maybe can hear the snarl. But none of these things are worth running away from, right? You don't run away from the color gray. And you don't run away from the snarling noise just because of the noise, right? If you ran away from the noise, it would be because of what the noise represents, which you can't hear. And probably the sheep doesn't have memories of wolves that it's met in the past because the sheep is still alive. <laughs> and in any case, sheep can ru will run away from a wolf the first time they see a wolf, right? They don't need to have experienced a wolf before. The sheep doesn't need to imagine the wolf, right? And also, if it were imagining a wolf, it wouldn't run. It would just go, ooh, wolves, I hate wolves, right? Rather, what's happening is that the sheep looks at the wolf and is like, this is what the giraffe does with the lion, right? Oh, crap. That looks dangerous. Or as, as Ibn Sina says, it's hostile. It's dangerous. And it turns and runs like hell. How is it doing this? And actually, I, I think Ibn Sina would say, well, Aristotle wouldn't be able to explain this. But I can explain it. My explanation is that the sheep has a faculty called wahm. And wahm is the ability to detect things like hostility. Another cozier example is that the um, sheep can also uh, perceive the familiarity of its own offspring. So that's why it kind of nuzzles or you know, takes care of its, its lamb. But it, it doesn't run from the lamb. And it doesn't cozy up to the wolf. It, does, it runs from the wolf and cozies up to the lamb. Okay? The reason it is able to do that is it has this power called wahm. And we have it too, right? So what we're seeing here is that actually Ibn Sina has, in a way, um, gone quite far in the direction of um, like expanding our conception of what animals are capable of. So he, he, I would say he offers us a picture of animal mental life, which is very rich, because what he's left for humans to do uniquely is very thin. It's just this kind of abstract universal thinking. And again, it's really important that all of these complicated things and sophisticated things that animals can do are always going to involve particulars as their cognitive content, right? So the, the sheep will never start thinking about, you know, why do the wolves hate us so much? Is it because we're so delicious? They don't think about it in that level, right? They just like, they're just like, here's a wolf. That's dangerous. I'm running. That's, that's all they do. There's no abstract thought. Um, now, uh, I, I gave not this paper, but a paper that had some of this material in it before. And um, Therese Antoine pointed out something to me that she had just been writing about in a paper which wasn't published at the time, namely that there's a passage in um, part of the logic of uh, Ibn Sina's biggest uh, philosophical work, the Shifa, that suggests that animals can use waham to discriminate between species. So this would be like my example, Gesundheit. This would be, as we say in Germany, <laughs> Gesundheit. Um, the, so this would be um, like the case I gave before where the giraffes are like, oh, giraffes versus lions, right? Um, and you might think, well, doesn't that start to suggest that animals do have the capacity to think of, at the level of universals? So maybe. But even in this very passage, he still draws this hard and fast distinction between waham and intellect, aku. So even there, he's saying, well, if animals can sort of classify particulars as being of a certain type, they still can't engage in intellection. So maybe there's some, some ambiguity here between exactly how much he kind of wants to pack into, the, into waham as opposed to aku. I find this passage quite puzzling, actually, how he can say this. Um, ultimately, it's going to be really important for him that proper, as such, universal thinking is only going to be cap possible for humans, and of course, God and angels, because only we have this immaterial, rational power. If you start saying that animals can grasp universals, 
then his proof for the immateriality of the soul will go for them just as much as for us. And then animal souls would be able to survive the death of their body, right? And you wouldn't want that. Or would you? Maybe you would want that. Ibn Sina doesn't. So Ibn Sina surely does not think that animals survive the death of their body. But that doesn't necessarily represent uh, a kind of unified, uh, unanimous opinion amongst Muslim scholars. Because in fact, in the Islamic theological tradition, the tradition that goes under the name of Kalam in Arabic, it's commonly thought that animals also enjoy an afterlife. Um, and there's good reason for this, namely that there are passage in, passages in the Quran that suggest an afterlife for the animals. Um, for example, uh, this is a passage from Quran uh, 6, 38. There is no creature on the earth or bird that flies with its wings except that they are communities like you. So it seems to imply some kind of political life, maybe, for animals. But then the important part is, unto their Lord they will be gathered. Well, that sounds like they're all going to heaven or something, right? Or going to paradise. And on the basis of this, and also on the basis that you don't want injustice in God's creation without it being somehow counterbalanced by some kind of justice, some Mutakalimun theologians said things like, oh, well, when animals are savagely torn to bits by predators, that's sad for them. <laughs> But the good news is then they go to paradise and they get lots of nice food to make it up to them. So as an um, uh, author who's written about this has said, the, on, on this for this particular school of Kalam, God is like a cosmic bookkeeper who's like, oh, well, this giraffe got savaged to death by lions. So the giraffe will get, you know, 30 years of really nice acacia leaves or something in, in paradise. And then God is like, okay, you've been rewarded enough to make up for that. It's, sorry about that thing that happened to you 30 years ago. I know that was rough. But look at all the nice leaves you got, right? Um, that might be a little bit too crude, a way of thinking about it. But somehow God makes it up to them in the afterlife. And in general, um, there's a very strong trend in Kalam of thinking that animals somehow participate in the afterlife, which brings us to Fakhrina Razi because it is precisely in the context of talking about the afterlife in a work of his called Mulachas, um, which was only just recently edited. But actually, when we started working on this, we were um, looking, at the, looking at the work in manuscripts. Um, so it's, this is like a very recently, a work that's only very recently started to get um, studied. So it's one of several works he wrote that kind of survey philosophical and theological um, questions across a wide variety of um, topics. He, so he's talking about the afterlife. And then without really explaining that that's the relevant context, he says, now here's a question. Do animals have rational souls or not? Do they have, do they have rational souls like humans, or do they have a different kind of soul, like the philosophers would say? And although he doesn't spell this out, I think that, and um, I, I've written a paper about this with Bly. Um, we think that he must be thinking the reason why it's worth discussing this is that if animals didn't have rational souls, then at least according to Ibn Sina's arguments for, um, for the immateriality and hence immortality of our soul, um, if, if they don't have rational souls, then they must die when their bodies die, and then they wouldn't have an afterlife. But as a theologian, he wants to at least be open to the possibility that animals do have an afterlife. Um, now, so this is actually, typically for him, this is quite a complicated thing going on here. Because what he's thinking is, well, if I were an Avicennan philosopher, then I would think that the only way for animals to have an afterlife is for them to be rational. Now, actually, he's not an Avicennan philosopher. He's a critic of Ibn Sina. But what he wants to do, I think, is to suggest, well, I'm going to give an argument that would show Ibn Sina that he should admit that animals have an afterlife. And then if I can show that, since theologians also with their own kind of theory of uh, the soul and whatever, 
if they would also think that animals would have an afterlife, then everyone could sort of agree. So this is almost like um, a way of saying, well, even the, even the kind of toughest nut to crack, namely an Aristotelian slash Avicennan physician, should still think that animals have an afterlife because they should admit that animals are rational. And if they admit that animals are rational, then they should admit that animals have an afterlife. Now, that's obviously imputing a lot to him because he doesn't, he doesn't spell anything, any of that out in the text. But I think that's the kind of basis for the argument. Um, in any case, what's, even if you kind of set that aside, what's really worth our interest is the way he argues for animal rationality. And as we're going to see, he really kind of presupposes the truth of Ibn Sina's own way of thinking about rationality. So, because if you think about it, there's two ways you could go at this, right? You could say, well, you say that intellection or rationality, akl, is characterized by universal abstract thought. But that's not true. I'm using my intellect when I decide what to have for dinner, right? Cake, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Bad choice, but a choice nonetheless. Uh, and, but then he knows that Ibn Sina would say, no, 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 no. That's just imagination or, you know. You're remembering some cake you had. You're imagining the cake you could have. You're, you're engaging in something that's not full-blown intellection. So that doesn't count. So what he's going to do is maybe for the sake of argument, he's going to say, let's, let's suppose that intellection is what you say it is. And I'm going to show you that animals, by that criterion, must have intellect. And this is really clear from the first argument he gives. There's five arguments. I'm going to give you two of them. Um, and the first argument comes in kind of three with three cases to illustrate it. So the first argument is that animals must have the ability to grasp universals as such. They don't only grasp particulars. Why? Well, first of all, even exercise, and this I think is a really remarkable thing to say, even the exercise of sense perception involves grasping universals because to see a wolf and see it as something other than just a patch of gray is to see it as a wolf. Now, th this is actually an interesting question in Aristotelian philosophy. So what would Aristotle say about this? What does Aristotle think about seeing something as a wolf? He might say, well, properly speaking, what you see is something gray, but then you kind of layer on top of that the information that it's a wolf or something like that. But Fahreddin is thinking, well, take this example that we have from Ibn Sina, the sheep seeing the wolf, seeing that the wolf is dangerous. Um, it must be able to perceive the wolf as a wolf, as a member of a hostile species in order to react appropriately. So all of that kind of abstract universal content is already built into sense perception. This is a profoundly un-Aristotelian thing to say, or at least if not un-Aristotelian, it's against the Aristotelian tradition. This is exactly what Aristotelians have been denying for literally more than a thousand years. So they've always said sense perception is of particulars, not universals. And Fahreddin is like, nah, if you think about it, sense perception is of universals too, because you're classifying or you're kind of um, you're sort of subsuming the particular that you see under a particular universal in order to react to it appropriately. And it's obvious that um, animals can do this. This is a quite a remarkable move on his part. Um, and, the next, and the next case he gives, another illustration of the fact that um, animals can, can grasp universals, is if anything, even more clever. So let's imagine that the sheep sees the wolf and it turns to run. So now it's intending to run, OK? And an Aristotelian would say, no problem, it runs. But Fahreddin says, well, hang on a second. Is it intending to perform the particular act of running it's about to perform? No. It's not like, oh, I'm going to run exactly in this way, away from this wolf. Like, I'm going to put my foot exactly there and exactly there. No. It's going to just run like hell. Any act of running would be fine, right? Any act of running that will get it away from the wolf would be perfectly adequate. In fact, probably it couldn't think, it couldn't intend very exactly to perform a particular act of running. Um, 
it, this might actually connect to uh, something that you, uh, that there's an argument that you sometimes get in Kalam, which is that God and not we must be the creator of our acts because we aren't able to create particular acts down to the level of finest detail. Why? How do we know this? Well, the, an example that I give is imagine you write your name and then someone says to you, okay, now write your name again exactly the same down to the molecule. No chance, right? You wouldn't even be able to come close. You could make, something, you could make a signature or something that looks basically similar but of course you couldn't make something exactly identical in every detail, whereas God could. And then they say, well, if you can't do it the second time, then obviously you can't do it the first time. If you were capable of producing this, then you could do it again, but you can't. So it must be God creating your signature and not you. This is an argument for occasionalism. Whether that's in the background here, I'm not sure, but it's very similar, it's a very similar thought. So the idea is that the, the sheep is not going to be able to intend to perform exactly the act of running that it performs. It can only intend generically to run. And this, I think, is a brilliant argument. So this is showing that what is in the, as it were, in the mind of the sheep is a universal, namely running, and not a particular, namely the particular act of running it's about to perform. Very clever. Third example, and this may be the easiest, is imagine a sheep that's looking for grass. Um, and he actually gives the example of looking for grass, of an animal looking for grass. He says, the animal's not looking for some particular grass. Right, like, oh no, not that one. I, I, had a, I had some different grass in mind. They don't care, they're just looking for grass. Right? In other words, they're looking for something that instantiates the universal grass. So again, they, what is, as it were, in their mind has to be a universal, not a particular. I mean, think about it like this. All of the particular examples of grass that the sheep have ever seen are, not, are precisely the ones that aren't relevant, right? Because they've already been eaten by the sheep and the sheep's friends, right? What I'm looking for is some grass that I've never experienced yet. So I'm precisely looking not for the particular grasses I've seen, but for a new one, like I'll go over there, right? He also has this nice example of smelling that there's some grass and being like, oh, that must be some grass. Not some particular grass, but just grass, okay? Now, I think this is interesting now to think about what an Aristotelian slash Avicennan would say in response. Maybe they would say, well, the animal is not grasping these things qua universal. So they're somehow operating as if they had a universal in their mind, but they don't because they're not sort of explicitly entertaining the universal and thinking about it as such. But if that's the answer, I think it's not a very good one because remember that Avicenna's argument was in order to receive the universal at all, you have to have an immaterial power. And it looks like they are, it, it, to, and, it, and it looks like to operate with a, an, with a universal concept, the animal needs to have such an immaterial power, whether or not it's thinking about it as such. So I actually think Fakhreddin's argument here is very um, convincing. Um, oh, sorry, the, these sl slides are in the, in the wrong order. Um, the, the, there's another argument, the fourth one, where he just reels off a very short list of uh, amazing things that animals do. And there's a parallel text in another work, which I also wrote an article about, um, about um, what the... Uh, about all these sort of amazing things that, that animals, like amazing behaviors that animals display. He gives the example of hexagonal cells in a beehive. Um, he gives an example that our colleague Sarah Virgi wrote a, a whole paper about. This is, this is a, an example that comes up already in antiquity and then a whole series of texts in the Islamic world. The example is a mouse wants to get at some oil in a bottle, because apparently mice like to sip oil. I didn't know this. And the bottle has a narrow neck, and it's too narrow for the animal to like poke its head in and lick the oil. So what it does is it sits on top, dips its tail into the oil, sort of swirls its tail around, pulls it out, and licks its tail. And I don't know if mice actually do this, but you can sort of imagine a mouse doing this, right? 
And if and the idea is if humans could, sorry if animals can do this, then they must be just as capable of reasoning as humans are, right? This is just supposed to amaze you <laughs> with the with the um, things that animals do. So the upshot is that um, animals can grasp universals. They can engage in reasoning, means and reasoning, like we just saw with the mouse. The kind of universal reasoning that, it need, that is needed to engage in sense perception, look for food, perform motions. And that should show that um, animals, whatever you say about an, uh, human reasoning, you should say about animals too. So if humans can do this because they have immaterial souls, then you should say that animals have immaterial souls. Um, there might be another thing that's in play here, namely that in general, Fakhreddin is quite skeptical of what you might call the faculty psychology theory that we find in Aristotelianism, where you have like sensation and imagination and memory and so on. Fakhreddin, along with some other philosophers of the period, especially someone named Abu Barakat al-Baghdadi, who's going to be relevant again in a second, um, they thought that this is kind of a wrong way of approaching philosophical psychology, and that what you should say is that you have a soul, which is just one kind of power, and it can do a whole bunch of things. So rather than, I mean, this is kind of a tendentious way of thinking about the Avicenna and slash Aristotelian position, but they would say, well, they think that you see, that what, what sees is your vision, and what imagines is your imagination. Whereas we think that when I imagine, the person, the thing that's imagining is just me, right? So it's just one of many actions that I can perform. So they ha they're trying to articulate a view according to which there's this single subject of cognition, which we might call the self. And this self is just what does everything. Uh, and, and the reason why I think that might be relevant is that it's, as given what we've seen uh, from Fakhreddin about animals, it looks like he's trying to question this very hard and fast kind of leveled theory of cognition where you have reason up here and imagination and sensation down here. So for example, think about what he said um, in the first argument here. You can't even do sense perception without using intellect, right? So that would kind of push you in the direction of thinking that different forms of cognition kind of involve each other. And that would go along very nicely with the idea that it's just one self or soul doing all the cognition, rather than the idea that you have these separate faculties which somehow get put together to form a rich mental life. OK, in any case, um, the, um, what we've seen is that, um, as, as I say, we have all these examples of like clever things that animals do, um, some of them actually drawn from Ibn Sina, and even going all the way back to Aristotle. And this should show that, th that animals, too, are intelligent. Um, and all of this is within, to some extent, within the framework of the conventional view, right? the traditional Aristotelian view, because he's assuming that the possession of reason somehow goes along with the ability to outlive the death of the body, right? That's, I, I think, the whole point. Now then, one thing about Razi is that he always will consider objections on every side of every dispute. So he will very rarely advance a position without then saying, well, but there's an objection to this position. So that's what he does too here. And he says, um, well, here's an objection. If animals were rational, then there'd only be one kind of soul. And probably he's not thinking about plants, right? Because he hasn't argued that plants are rational or that plants can engage in sense perception. So there'd only be a single kind of soul, which is jointly shared by humans and animals. And so he wouldn't even have a distinction between these different kinds of soul anymore, right? Um, now, actually, this is an interesting uh, there's an interesting kind of long-running debate here. If you think about it, the, we kind of very naturally associate, in the Aristotelian tradition, the idea that we, we very naturally associate different types of soul with different kind of levels of existence, right? So there's 
human rational souls, there's animal souls, and then there's plant souls. So we think there are three kinds of souls. But you wouldn't have to do it like that, right? So for example, you could say there's plant souls and there's non-plant souls. So you could be less fine-grained. Or you could be more fine-grained, right? So for example, you could say there's the kind of soul that really smart people have. And then there's the kind of soul that kind of dumb people have. And then in the between, there's sort of the mediocre souls. And then there's the animal souls. Right? Or you could say that there's, uh, there's the carnivorous souls and the plantiferous souls, herbivorous, yes, herbivorous souls, right? So there's different, you could have carved it up in all kinds of ways, to use a very apt metaphor given all the tearing apart of limbs we've been discussing during this talk. So why do it this way? And in fact, um, just in the immediate environment of Fakhreddin, there's been a slightly earlier, earlier philosopher named uh, Abu Barakat al-Baghdadi, who said, well, actually, maybe different humans have different kinds of souls. So like maybe courageous people have one kind of soul, and cowardly people have another kind of soul. Um, this is an idea that has just been flirted with in the tradition. But Fakhreddin doesn't really like, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't really want to smash all the different kinds of souls together, nor does he want to say that there are different species of human soul. He wants to adhere to the traditional idea that there are human souls and non-human souls, animal souls, and that you can somehow distinguish them. Yet, now he's saying, well, I can't define human souls just in respect of their rationality, because I'm now suggesting that animal souls can be, reason can be rational as well. So what he says is, um, there might be, uh, and by the way, sorry, I should have, I should have uh, gotten to this slide first. He, he actually mentions this thing from Abu Barakat about courageous and cowardly souls. And he says, this is like lions and rabbits. Right? So lions have one kind of soul. Rabbits have another kind of soul. Lions are brave. Uh, rabbits are timid. Um, but the fact that, and so you can, you can find these differences if you want, but the fact that there might be some kind of shared commonality between human souls and animal souls doesn't prove that there's no difference between human souls and animal souls. Because maybe animals have reason, and we have reason, but we have more of it than they do. So we're intelligent to a much greater degree than animals are intelligent. And that's really the difference. Um, so his idea here would apparently be that there's a kind of continuum of intelligence from animals up to humans with us at the top. Or maybe we're not at the top, actually, right? Because probably angels and for sure God are more intelligent and rational than we are. So maybe we're actually sort of in the middle. But if you leave these exalted beings out in the natural world, we're the most intelligent, rational creatures. And then animals are less rational and intelligent than us. And plants are not rational and intelligent at all. Something he doesn't get into, one would really like to know what he thinks about this. He doesn't get that much into the, uh, the question of whether non-human animals are at different places on the scale. But it's kind of suggested by these passages where he gives you all of these examples of, of clever animals. Because of course, not all animals are capable of this kind of clever behavior, right? Like slugs don't do things like dipping their tail in oil and licking it. And it's not just because they don't have tongues. Or maybe slugs do have tongues. Slugologist in the house, anyone? No? OK, let's say for the sake of argument that slugs don't have tongues. They, even if they had tongues, they couldn't do this, right? Dogs are smarter than you know, turtles. Well, I should, I should actually have no idea how smart turtles are. Maybe they're very smart, just rather slow. But you see what I mean, right? So, there, so maybe there's probably a continuum of smartness, of intelligence, within the animal kingdom. He doesn't really get into that. He kind of gestures towards it by talking about what some animals can do. But the really interesting thing would be that if you have human intelligence as the kind of gold standard, then you could have some like at least fairly smart animals that are less intelligent than us, but still rational. And that would secure their, um, their participation in the afterlife. So hence the title of the talk. So I said that the talk would be about an Islamic thinker who's denying human exceptionalism. And it's true that 
were not exceptional on his view, at least if you, I mean, there are some texts where he is kind of non-committal about all of this, but at least in the Mulachas, this one text we've been looking at, he seems to be quite committed to the view that animals are intelligent, but they're not as intelligent that, as we are. And in that sense, we do remain exceptional. And of course, that is important for him as a theologian too, because God's relationship towards animals may be benevolent. He may give animals an afterlife. Um, he may even accept praise from animals. There are texts that say that animal calls and the noises they make are prayers to God that we don't understand and so on. But still, God's relationship to humans is going to be very different from his relationship to the rest of the animal kingdom and he would want it that way. Thanks very much. <clears throat>